A pipeline is a line of pipes. It's used to transport an object from here to there. An oil pipeline transports crude oil from a well to a refinery. A gas pipeline transports natural gas from a well to a processing plant. A water pipeline transports drinking water from a treatment facility to a home or business. A sewage pipeline transports waste from a home or business to a treatment plant. And a data pipeline transports digital data from one storage location to another storage location. You'll most often hear data compared to oil as in, data is the new oil. This is especially useful when thinking about an oil pipeline as a refinery process that converts crude oil into a useful product like gasoline. We call unprocessed data raw data and processed data refined data. Crude oil is a dark sticky liquid that's not useful until it's refined by chemical engineering processes. Similarly, raw data is often in a messy, semi-structured format that cannot be analyzed until it's refined by data engineering tasks. We can view an oil pipeline as a refinery process of tasks where the output of one task is the input of the next task. First, crude oil is pumped from an oil well. The crude is transported from the well to a refinery. Distillation uses heat to separate the crude oil into different components. A conversion process changes the chemical makeup of the distilled components. Several of the converted components are brought together to create gasoline and the gasoline is shipped to a warehouse and then onto your local gas stations for consumption. Similarly, we can view a data pipeline as a refinery process of tasks, where the output of one task is the input of the next task. A copy of raw data is extracted from its original source. The data moves to a server where it will be processed. Records that don't meet certain criteria are filtered out. Values are transformed and records are reformatted. Source values are joined with reference data and the refined records are stored in a location for consumption by BI tools and analytic models. The use of the word pipeline in computer science is not new. We've been using it ever since the 1950s when we started using pipeline to describe how a CPU divides instructions into a series of sequential steps. Data and instructions are fetched from memory and moved into the CPU. The control unit translates instructions into a form that the ALU understands. The ALU processes the instructions and the control unit releases the result from the CPU and stores it in memory. Another pipeline example from computer science is a graphics pipeline which describes the steps a graphics system performs to render a 3D scene onto a 2D screen. Since there are many kinds of pipelines in the computer industry, we say data pipeline instead of just pipeline. Thus far, I've only visualized data pipelines as simple linear flows, but they can be more complex using branching logic. Instead of representing each section of a pipeline with a pipe, we can use a vertex and an edge like this to create a graph. Here's another example of using vertices and edges to represent a pipeline as a graph. Structures like these are called directed acyclic graphs. The edges flow in one direction and the graph doesn't contain any cycles so it's acyclic. In contrast, this graph is cyclic because it contains at least one cycle. The reason that DAGs are so popular today 
is because they are inherently parallel, so they are perfect for cluster computing frameworks like Hadoop and Spark. To use Hadoop's MapReduce system, you write code for a map function and a reduce function. Then the system automatically spreads the code across the servers in a cluster. A large file is accessed as input. Each split of the file is processed individually with the map function running in parallel to transform the data into key value pairs. The system automatically shuffles the map results by key to the servers that will perform the reduce function. The reduce code merges the values with the same key into a single result and the final results are written to one or more files. So you see, each MapReduce job is a data pipeline and can run in parallel distributed fashion because it forms a DAG. To achieve your desired goal, you almost always need to chain together multiple MapReduce jobs. Another Hadoop component named Uzi enables you to essentially create a DAG of DAGs by scheduling a complex Hadoop data pipeline which is defined by coding an XML document. Soon after Yahoo released Hadoop as an open source project, they realized how difficult it was to write data pipelines in Java by using only two kinds of functions, map and reduce. So they created a higher level of abstraction named the PIG system. PIG Latin is a data flow language used to create data pipelines. Data flow languages have been around since the 1970s, and in the 1980s, the term pipeline data flow started to be used. After you write a data pipeline in the PIG Latin language, the PIG system automatically converts your code into a collection of Java MapReduce programs, and then runs the DAG in parallel across your Hadoop cluster. So PIG offers a terrific higher level of abstraction, but it still depends on Hadoop's disk-based operations. So the Spark system was created to enable you to create data pipelines that can run in memory using many more transformation functions than just map and reduce. I've drawn pretty pictures of MapReduce, PIG, and Spark DAGs, but remember that you actually create these data pipelines by writing computer programs. MapReduce is written in the general purpose language Java, PIG is written in the domain specific language PIG Latin, and Spark is written in the general purpose language Scala. To achieve an even higher level of abstraction, you need to use a system that doesn't require computer programming. One example of such a system is named StreamSets, and it uses this graphical user interface. To create a data pipeline with StreamSets, you drag and drop an origin icon onto the canvas to represent the source of your raw data. You drop multiple processor icons to transform the data, and you drop one or more destination icons to represent a new location for the refined data. When you run your data pipeline in cluster batch mode, StreamSets automatically converts your graphical representation into a DAG of MapReduce jobs. When you run in a cluster streaming mode, StreamSets automatically converts your data pipeline into a DAG of Spark stages. So StreamSets offers a very high level of abstraction over the traditional methods of writing computer programs to create cluster computing tasks. Your origin stage can source data from the big three cloud vendors and from databases, file systems, messages, protocols, and services. There is some overlap between origin and destination types, plus some destination-only types, including Cassandra, Couchbase, Flume, HBase, Kudu, and Solar. There are currently about four dozen different processors that you can use to transform data. 
Even though you only use a single origin stage in each data pipeline, you can use a lookup processor to enrich your origin with data from JDBC databases, HBase, MongoDB, Kudu, Redis, and Salesforce. In a standard single-threaded data pipeline, an origin creates a batch of records and runs it through the pipeline. The default batch size is 1,000 records. A new batch is created only after the previous batch has fully processed and reaches the destination. Some origins can generate multiple threads to enable parallel processing. For a multi-threaded data pipeline, StreamSets creates more than one pipeline runner. Each thread connects to the origin system, creates a batch of records, and passes the batch to an available runner. I'm going to close out this video by describing a few terms you'll hear about in regards to StreamSets. Webster defines the word drift as a gradual change in a characteristic that is supposed to remain constant. You should still be paying attention to what I'm saying, but your mind is probably starting to drift. According to the people at StreamSets, data drift is the unpredictable and continuous mutation of data characteristics. Their point is that when you create a data pipeline, you should assume that the origin will change characteristics about the data as time goes by. For example, the schema will probably slowly evolve and attributes will be added, changed, and dropped. Back in the 1990s, when we started creating ETL processes to populate data warehouses, characteristics were fairly easy to understand. Data origins were usually internal, and data feeds were purpose-built to send structured data from an application database to a data warehouse database. We created ETL processes that rigidly mapped origin attributes to destination attributes. But since these data feeds were built specifically to populate an internal warehouse, the ETL maintainers would be notified by the internal origin system whenever they plan to evolve their schema. What's different about things today is that our origins are often external entities like services or devices, and their data is not being specifically produced for just our own consumption. The data also usually arrives in a semi-structured format with embedded schemas that can easily change. StreamSets was built to anticipate and handle drift. Pipelines are intent-driven and require minimal specification of structure during setup. For example, if you're expecting payment information in a data stream, it's sufficient to state the intent as the presence of a credit card number as an attribute. It could be irrelevant what other attributes are, how many there are, or whether they change over time. The term data ops was coined in a blog post in 2014, the same year that StreamSets was founded. Data ops is a contraction of data operations, and it's the application of DevOps practices to data engineering. StreamSets now refers to its line of software products as a data ops platform, and it includes their open source data collector product that I've shown screenshots of, plus their commercial products like Control Hub, Data Flow Performance Manager, and Data Protector. Instead of ETL, the StreamSets people sometimes talk about an ETL T design pattern with a small T and a big T. The small t is for when you do very light transformations on data as it streams in. Your main goal here is to land the raw data quickly. For example, you could use stream sets in cluster streaming mode to consume data continuously from a Kafka topic. 
Under the covers, StreamSets runs a Spark streaming job to land raw data into your Hadoop distributed file system. The Big T can use cluster computing to run computationally expensive transformations on the raw data. Continuing with our example, we can run stream sets in cluster batch mode on the raw data that streamed into Hadoop earlier today. Under the covers, stream sets launches MapReduce jobs to process the raw data into a refined asset that can be used for analytics. Coming full circle back to the start of this video, small t processes are like oil pipelines used to transport crude to a refinery. After the crude is pumped out of a well, its density and sulfur content are quickly checked before oil is pushed to a refinery. A big T process is like an oil refinery pipeline. Now that the crude oil has been shipped to a refinery, all of the intensive transformations can be performed on each batch of crude to convert it into gasoline that can be consumed at gas stations.